Gives a whole new meaning to the term a hybrid cow. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, yeah. couldn't resist. Um, Tom has been, been, been working for years on a ho holistic views of ecosystems and how they can be, uh, be healed and made uh, um, uh, integral c uh, contributors to ecological and social sustainability. I know you've, you've been doing some work that looks at what, what's going to, what could amount to negative emissions as well, and I wonder if you can tell us about some of that. So, so I came to uh, what I'm about to describe uh, having a, spent 25 years looking at the role of forests in relation to climate change, uh, but also looking at the interaction between the biological world uh, and what climate change uh, was doing to it. Uh, and eventually, I've concluded that two degrees is fact, in fact quite dangerous for the ecosystems and the biology of the planet, uh, and that something more in the range of uh, say 350 parts per million is where we need to get to. And, and when you start thinking that way, you're desperate to find negative emissions. Uh, and when you begin to look at it at the scale of the entire planet and the atmosphere, it turns out our terrestrial ecosystems have lost between 200 and 250 billion tons of carbon in the last three centuries. Uh, my guess is once we really appreciate soil carbon, uh, that number may even go up. Uh, so if you turn that around and talk about how can you restore some of that carbon by restoring degraded grazing land, reforestation, uh, agricultural practices like Sarah was describing, uh, I think there is a potential for a serious number uh, in the negative emissions game, uh, at least 100 billion tons, maybe more. Uh, so there's nothing particularly new about what I'm just saying, except thinking of it on the scale of planetary engineering with ecosystems. Uh, and it's basically talking about making the living planet more habitable by improving the living planet. Wow, I just want to say this illustrates the the positive approach that we tried to take in the book, and I think you can see from this, the, this panel's response to that question, succeeded in taking in the, in the book and looking hard at the science and, and taking a real cold look at it without uh, um, rose-colored glasses at how much we need to do um, to affect changes in the climate that we need and how possible it is from what uh, Sarah and Tom have just said. But um, time is racing on, but let me just see before we go to another question whether there's any particular uh, clarifying question or some uh, burning question that someone wants to ask, particularly with regard to uh, this negative emissions. Ray Anderson? I'd, like for Tom to comment. I'd love for Tom to comment on the state of the oceans. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, as we all know, the oceans are in really bad shape. The, you know, most of the fisheries are, are really degraded and declining. The oceans are more acid because of the CO2 in the atmosphere that potentially affects anything that mobilizes calcium carbonate mm -hmm. as part of its skeleton. Protein. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of carbon which has been absorbed by the oceans. Uh, you know, otherwise things would be a lot worse. Uh, but basically the, the higher CO2 levels go in the atmosphere, the more acid the oceans will become and they're already 30% more acid, uh, which I think maybe as a single factoid tells you what damage we've done. Great. Uh, okay, we'll try one more there. In the back there, two thirds of the way back on, the, on my right. Hi, thanks. Uh, Dave Grossman here with the Climate Law and Policy Project. I was just wondering uh, what you feel like the prospects are for getting 350 or Below or 300 or 280 or whatever we're going to aim for. What are the prospects for adding these stronger targets into the negotiations and into government policies? I'll tell you what, can I ask that we, we take that question? As it happens, you've anticipated my third question quite nicely. <laughs> and in an effort to move on, I'm going to remember your question. Don't let me forget it. But I'm going to actually see if we can't 
get that kind of assessment out of the, uh, my last question. If it doesn't happen, you get the next, you get the first question in the overall discussion. But let me move on now to a second question um, in the interest of time. Uh, Chris Flavin mentioned that this is uh, an incredibly rapidly evolving, fast moving uh, discussion, even though, uh, as Dr. Liedegaard said, we've been talking about this for more than 20 years. We, we should know enough to act. Nonetheless, the details keep changing. If anything, they change in, an, in a direction toward greater urgency. I think we'd, we'd, most of us would agree. But I wanted to ask, since a book takes a, a, a little while, uh, kind of like a pregnancy does, um, there's a bit of a gap between when things are written and when they actually see the light of day. Um, I wanted to ask our authors if they could assess what's happened or their own thinking since they handed in their drafts and we did our editing of them uh, that has either changed or amplified or somehow uh, helped evolve their thinking about some of their main points. And uh, maybe I'll start this time with Sarah. Sure. And there, just very, very briefly. Yeah, there are actually a, a lot of things. I, I want to focus on just, uh, just sort of three key points. Um, I would say that a year, a year ago, whenever it was we started this stuff, there's still within the land use sector among farming organizations, et cetera, they were just clueless in most parts of the world about both the opportunity and the need. And there has been a huge, um, I think, shift in that in terms of the International Federation of Agricultural Producers. If you look at the African countries, they are really mobilizing to make sure that Africans particular concerns around land degradation, the need for sustainable land management, et cetera, is actually reflected as an opportunity in, in, in Copenhagen. A second one is actually the opening in the United States by the Department of Agriculture of its first ever ecosystem services office, which is charged with trying to promote these kinds of carbon activities um, and land use. Um, and, I, and I think the, the third one, which maybe is more of a technical point, but one of the constraints for doing some of the land use work around a, a, a larger systems has been the difficulty of measuring these complex dynamic kinds of processes. And there has actually been huge advances during this particular year um, in the development of methodologies that make it much more practical and feasible to be trying to, 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 to track um, change in, in a way that would allow us to include it in policy. So those are sort of three Excellent. key things. Thank you. Tom? So I guess uh, there are a couple things, but the, the first is uh, I've been uncomfortable for a long time with the two degree goal. Uh, but what finally pushed me over the edge is thinking about it, you know, here we are three quarters of a degree warmer with another half a degree approximately already baked in the system. Uh, and we're already seeing threshold changes in ecosystems. So that's coral bleaching. Uh, in the oceans of the world, and it is the the, uh, the the native bark beetles getting the upper hand in coniferous forests in North America and also uh, in parts of Europe as well. So if we're seeing that now, uh, clearly uh, two degrees is just where we don't want to go, and that's why I end up at 350. And the second thing was just sort of beginning to think scale about what terrestrial ecosystems could do for carbon. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. 